Accuse your enemies of doing what you are doing so as to create confusion. Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and what a time it is to be a YouTube law talking guy. That's why you're the judge and I'm the law talking guy. The lawyer. Right. It literally feels that there is not one day that goes by where there is not a massive development in some legal story that I have been following for a while, and it feels like that because it's true. Today, it's an update on that Missouri couple, the McCloskeys, Patricia and Mark McCloskey, who were indicted on firearm charges for brandishing, brandishing firearms at a group of protesters that were passing their house in a gated community after having gotten into the gated community. And if you are not familiar with this story, I won't even accuse you of living under a rock. I have friends and family who are not familiar with the details of this story. I think it's safe to say that everybody knows the basics of the story. Everybody at least saw a snippet of the video that went viral. They saw the image that went viral. An elderly couple standing on the front stoneway of a massive mansion brandishing firearms at a group of protesters who made it into the gated community. The man is holding a big gun and the woman is holding a small gun and holding it in a manner that uh, elicited some laughter on the internet. What? It also became the source material of some hilarious memes and here are just a few examples. Shortly after the incident, after the video went viral, after the media frenzy, police came and actually seized the weapons from the McCloskeys, and shortly thereafter, they were in fact indicted on firearm charges. In particular, they were indicted on brandishing a firearm, and if you don't know what that provision of law says, I'm going to read it to you because it's going to be very relevant for what comes in the later part of this vlog. 2005 Missouri Revised Statutes. Unlawful use of weapons. Exceptions. Penalties. A person commits the crime of unlawful use of weapons if he or she knowingly, skip to subparagraph 4, exhibits in the presence of one or more persons any weapon in an angry or threatening manner. Readily capable of lethal use. Set aside for the moment what on earth is meant by exhibiting a weapon in an angry or threatening manner. And incidentally, I've done a vlog on this already. If you haven't seen it, give it a watch. I'll link it right here. I have also discussed it at length with Robert Barnes during our weekly live streams. If you're not familiar with our weekly live streams, every Sunday night we do a live stream, which I then turn into a podcast. All of the links to that stuff are in the pinned comment below. And we decide as a prosecution that it's, quote, angry or threatening the manner in which you did it when we can prosecute you. I think the statute on its face violates the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So I think it also violates the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution for due process purposes because it's so vague. Define angry. Define threatening. So well, the, the, as, as, the statute, by the way, does not define either. Setting aside the potentially unconstitutional ambiguity as to what is meant by exhibiting a weapon in an angry or threatening manner... <laughs> setting aside the potential unconstitutionality of this very provision as relates to the Castle Doctrine, self-defense, Second Amendment rights, etc. What about the middle part about the weapon readily capable of lethal use? As drafted, in order to be guilty of subparagraph 4 of this provision of law, the weapon so exhibited in an angry or threatening manner must be readily capable of lethal use. That is a requirement to be found guilty of subsection 4. My understanding of this provision of law, and it seems to be the consensus among legal experts, is that if the weapon exhibited in an angry or threatening manner is not in fact readily capable of lethal use, one will not be found guilty of a violation of this section. Which brings us full circle to the incident and the seizure of the weapons and the state of at least the pistol when it was seized by the authorities. Now, it seems that when the weapons were seized, at the very least, the pistol that Madame McCloskey was holding was in fact inoperable. KMOV4, July 22nd, 2020. Report. Patricia McCloskey's handgun inoperable when seized by police. But the gun Patricia McCloskey had, a small handgun, examiners say, could not be test-fired as submitted. At the request of prosecutor Chris Hinckley, the report says, the firearm was 
stripped and found to have been assembled incorrectly. It was then reassembled properly, test fired and functioned as designed. Charging documents said the gun was capable of lethal use. Quote, it would be disheartening to learn, if accurate, that the authorities tampered with evidence in order to bring charges against an innocent member of the community, end quote. The McCloskey's attorney, Joel Schwartz, said. He declined to comment further. A previous attorney for the McCloskey's had indicated the gun had been rendered inoperable long before the incident because it had been used as an exhibit in previous lawsuits. That attorney, Al Watkins, had the gun in his possession for a short time, but turned it over to police. Just to open the parentheses that none of this apparently applies to the firearm that Mr. McCloskey was holding, apparently that one was able to be fired. All of this only applies to the firearm that Ms. McCloskey was holding, that little pistol or the microphone in the meme. Apparently that pistol, after being seized and when it was being investigated in the context of the prosecution, was in fact inoperable, had to be disassembled, reassembled so that it could be functional, so that Patricia McCloskey could be charged with the crime as drafted. That is to say, exhibiting a firearm in an angry or threatening manner, but a firearm that is readily capable of lethal use. Because if it's not readily capable of lethal use, Patricia McCloskey could not have been charged with that crime. And most people who were familiar with the McCloskey situation, in as much as they saw the snippet of the video that went viral or the image probably did not know all of this. There is in fact evidence that the prosecutors themselves are the ones who tampered with the evidence in order to make the gun operable so that they could prosecute Patricia McCloskey for that provision of law. It's a trap! And what news just came out yesterday or in the recent past, if you're watching this today or tomorrow, and none of that made any sense, but what news just came out? Well, the McCloskeys have been charged with additional charges, including tampering of evidence. <laughs> Which brings us full circle to my intro statement, accuse your enemies of doing what you are doing so as to create confusion. Now this expression is often wrongly attributed to Alinsky in his Alinsky's Rules for Radicals or Karl Marx. From the best of my research, it seems to be a variation of something Joseph Goebbels said in 1934. And for those of you who may not know, Joseph Goebbels or Paul Joseph Goebbels was the Minister of Propaganda for the Nazi regime from 1933 to 1945. And during a 1934 speech in Nuremberg, he was quoted as saying the following. The the cleverest trick used in propaganda against Germany during the war was to accuse Germany of what our enemies themselves were doing. To most, this seems to be the most accurate origin of the expression, accuse your enemies of what you are doing so as to create confusion, although the principle itself really is nothing more than a form of projection. Either way, back to the vlog and what I mean by accuse your enemies of doing what you are doing, it is in fact now the prosecutor's office who is accusing the McCloskeys of having tampered with evidence. Mr. McCloskey himself took to Twitter to express his dismay at these recent developments. So we got indicted today on two charges, displaying and tampering. We have no info on the tampering, no idea what we are supposed to have tampered. Upside down world. To which I responded with this undumb observation of what might be going on. I imagine the accusation is Mark McCloskey, quote, tampered with the evidence by having made the pistol non-functional, which is why the investigation had to, quote, re-tamper with evidence to make it functional to press the charges predicated on a pistol, quote, readily capable of lethal use. Accuse your enemy of doing what you are doing so as to create confusion or at the very least so as to justify what you are doing. The only reason the prosecution had to tamper with the evidence to make that pistol operable again was because they had tampered with the evidence to make the pistol inoperable. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. And just so that nobody accuses me of reflexively defending the McCloskeys, it is entirely possible that they in fact tampered with that pistol after the incident, rendering it inoperable so that they could not be charged with brandishing a firearm because that pistol would not be readily capable of lethal use. They are lawyers after all. It is entirely possible that between the incident and the firearms being seized by the authorities that they tampered with that pistol to render it inoperable, why they would have tampered only with the pistol and not with the bigger firearm that Mr. McCloskey was holding, I don't know, maybe it's because Ms. McCloskey's finger was on the trigger and they felt more exposure with that weapon, but it's entirely possible that they tampered with that pistol. Rendered it inoperable so that if and when it were to be seized, they would have a defense against that particular provision of law. It's possible. Would that justify the prosecution re-tampering with the pistol, reassembling it so that it would be rendered functional so they could press the appropriate or desired charges? I don't think so. Furthermore, if the pistol were in fact rendered inoperable for the reasons given by the McCloskey's attorneys, that being that it was used as a prop in a trial, I presume the McCloskey's have some form of certificate or evidence to show that that pistol was in fact rendered inoperable as of a specific date that predated the incident. It's always possible that the pistol was rendered inoperable for the trial to be used as a prop, then rendered operable again, then pointed at the crowd when there was the incident, then rendered inoperable again after the incident prior to being seized. Who knows? Anything is possible. Well, that's a very entertaining story, but unfortunately real detectives have to worry about that little thing called evidence. 
The only point being that there is no excuse for re-tampering with evidence to render a pistol operable so that charges can be pressed. Which is the perfect segue to actually looking at the charges of tampering with evidence. Tampering with physical evidence, 575.100.1. A person commits the crime of tampering with physical evidence if he, one, alters, destroys, suppresses, or conceals any record, document, or thing with purpose to impair its verity, legibility, or availability in any official proceeding or investigation, or two, makes, presents, or uses any record, document, or thing knowing it to be false with purpose to mislead a public servant who is or may be engaged in any official proceeding or investigation. Paragraph two, tampering with physical evidence is a class D felony if the actor impairs or obstructs the prosecution or defense of a felony. Otherwise, tampering with physical evidence is a class A misdemeanor. I would be very interested in seeing the evidence that was presented to the grand jury who authorized this indictment. I mean, is there concrete evidence that they in fact tampered with that firearm after the incident or is it just pure conjecture or is it just a pure setup to set up the prosecutors for having themselves tampered with the evidence? That evidence and information is not available at the moment of recording this vlog. I'm not sure if it is ever going to be available, but given what I know of indictments and the old saying that you could indict a ham sandwich, I am going to approach this with a requisite degree of skepticism. Skepticism with an open mind, willing to be changed as additional information comes out, and I will be following this story to be continued in future vlogs, and if you like my videos and you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment in the comment section below because it feeds the algorithm. If you want to support the channel, all of the support links are in the pinned comment. We've got PayPal, subscribe, start Patreon, YouTube membership. We have got merch, chicanery, but more important than all of that, take care of yourselves, check in on friends and family, make sure everyone around you is doing well during these difficult times, and now you know your vlog. Peace out. Peace out.